Hey, what is up everyone? It's the guy here and welcome to an episode of The Think. This is a series where I take some of my research into a topic of my interest and combine it with my thoughts and analysis to form a quick recap video about the topic. Now, this series does two things, and the first thing it does is that it forces me to solidify these concepts in my own mind so that I have the proper understanding to be able to present it to you all. And the second thing it does is it forms a conversation about the topic so that we can discuss what we think about the topic I've presented, maybe my thought process behind it, as well as just create an overall better collective understanding about the topic. In this episode, we'll take a look at a topic called systems thinking. I'll start off with a quick disclaimer and a list of sources that I used to form the ideas in this video. We'll then move on to some basic concepts of systems theory, the basis of systems thinking. And then to follow that up, we'll take a look at some examples and applications of systems thinking to make these concepts more tangible. And to wrap up this topic, I'll talk a bit about why I think this topic is important for us all to understand. All right, let's begin. A quick disclaimer to show transparency and integrity. I am by no means an expert in the topic of this video. I simply read the works and research published by others and portray a digested form of them here. I am also not paid or sponsored in this video. In general, my channel is not monetized. I will be using material from the following sources, all of which will have links directing to them in the descriptions below. The first source I used to form my understanding was a book by Donella H. Meadows called Thinking in Systems. This is a great book that gives an introduction to what systems thinking is, how it differs from traditional analytical thinking, provides examples of systems in the real world, and offers nuggets of wisdom to apply this knowledge. The second source I used was a video series called Systems Thinking Course by the YouTube channel Systems Innovation. This series provides an introduction to systems thinking in a video infographic format, probably more suited to the visual and aural learners. I also used Google to assign proper credit to quotes, verify facts, and improve the syntax of this video. Otherwise, all other ideas presented here were synthesized by me. Okay, let's start off with what systems thinking is. Systems thinking is an approach to understanding how the world works by studying the parts within a system, how they relate to each other, and how over time these relations build up the character of the systems they are part of. It is essentially the application of systems theory to how we understand the world we live in. In order to understand systems theory, we need to distinguish between systems and sets. Systems are collections of interdependent elements arranged in a particular order to achieve specific functions. A set, on the other hand, is a simple collection of elements with no shared function. A pile of stones on the ground is a set. Shuffling those stones around won't change what is there. The stones in a stone arch, however, are part of a system as they serve a common function and they have unique interdependent relationships. How those stones are arranged matters. Once we understand the difference between systems and sets, we can take a closer look at how systems work. The anatomy of a system composes of three things, elements, relations, and function or purpose. Elements are simply parts within a system. These parts could be physical, like gears, or institutions like the US federal government, or ideas like capitalism. Relations point to the connections or interactions between elements. Remember, the key differences between a set and a system are in how these elements are related to each other. These relations could mean an exchange of matter, energy, or ideas, and can be constructive or destructive in nature. We'll take a closer look at relations later in the video. The last thing a system has is a function or purpose. Generally, function is used to describe non-conscious systems and purpose is used for conscious ones. There is, however, a gray area between what is conscious and what is not, so these distinctions are not absolute. By looking at the anatomy of a system, we can already tell one of the crucial aspects of systems. Systems are more than the sum of their parts. These relations and the overall function of a system elevate the system to be much more than just a pile of components. By extension, the behavior of systems cannot be known by just identifying the elements from within. 
Knowing the elements of the system tells you nothing if you don't know how these elements relate to each other. To look at the dynamic relationships between elements in a system, we need to define a few more concepts, stocks and flows. Stocks, no, not these, are elements within a system that can be seen, felt, counted, or measured at any given time. This could be the volume of water in a reservoir, the energy in a battery, or the amount of money in a bank account. Flows, on the other hand, are how these stocks change over time. Rain is a flow that adds to the stock of water in the reservoir, and college tuitions are a flow that depletes the stock of money. Flows can be the relationships between elements, but also can be elements that govern the rates of change. Essentially, they're the derivative of the stock over time. From this, we can take a look at different feedback loops. You've probably already heard of the term, but to give a more rigorous definition, they are closed chains of causal connection from a stock through a set of decisions, rules, physical laws, or actions dependent on the level of the stock to the flows and back again. Essentially, they capture the dynamics of the differences between the stocks and flows and how they relate to each other. Feedback loops generally come in two varieties, balancing or negative and reinforcing or positive. Balancing loops are stabilizing loops that aim to keep a stock at a certain level. A thermostat is a good example. When the temperature gets too hot, it kicks on the air conditioning to lower the temperature, and when it gets too cold, it fires up the furnace to keep the temperature up. As you can already guess, reinforcing loops amplify changes to the stocks. Populations are good examples here. The more people you have, the more people you can have, meaning the more people you will have, meaning more people production. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a moment. With the concepts and models we have so far, we're ready to introduce a few ideas to munch on as we explore deeper. The first is that, psychologically, humans tend to focus on stocks before flows and inflows before outflows. With all psychological observations, this is not a law, and by knowing about it, you can actually change what you focus on. But can we see how this natural reaction can cause issues? Stocks are elements, and if we remember our first crucial aspect of systems and what it means, it tells us that we often don't understand the behavior of systems because we haven't taken relations into account. Just looking at acres of forest left in a region isn't going to tell you anything if you don't look at what is increasing it and what is depleting it. Not seeing the complete picture can be equally disastrous. If your house is cold, you might think about buying a beefier furnace, but if you forget about insulation and how heat leaks out of your house, then your solution will be very inefficient at best, and it might even make the problem worse. Keep that observation in mind as you and others around you attempt to model the world. Another observation that will add to our crucial aspect of systems is the following. In reality, actors, like people, don't control stock and rarely control flow, but rather affect higher derivatives affecting both. If you want to drain a bathtub, you don't just make the water disappear, you open the drain and let the water out. You never directly change the stock, instead you manipulate the flow. For simple examples, you can quite easily manipulate flow, but for more complex systems, you don't even have direct control over that. Even for the bathtub example, you don't instantly set the faucet to be on to a full blast, but instead turn a knob, changing how quickly you change the rate that water fills the tub. What this aspect of systems means is that systems will often exhibit delayed and exponential behavior. Anyways, keep those in the back of your mind as we finish up these basic concepts. As we noted earlier, these relations and loops can be constructive or destructive. When the combined effects of two or more parts is greater than the sum of the effects separately, we call this phenomenon synergy. On the other hand, when the combined output of parts is less than the sum of the parts, we call this interference. Separately, two siblings may be able to accomplish a certain amount of work. But if you make them work together and they hate each other, you might get more out of just asking them to work separately. On the other hand, you wouldn't be addicted to a pile of glass, plastic, aluminum, gold, and lithium, right? Unless you're snorting that whole cocktail, that doesn't sound very appealing. You can, however, quite easily get addicted to your phone. 
but your phone is made of the same material. It's in a different form, sure, but it's still the same stuff. And in fact, it's these synergistic relationships that forms the phenomenon called emergence. Emergence is a process whereby larger entities, patterns, regularities arise through the interactions between smaller or simpler entities that themselves do not exhibit these properties. Just by looking at how the raw resources of a smartphone like gold, silica, and aluminum work separately, or even higher level components like cameras, transistors, and chips work separately, won't tell you everything that a smartphone can do. Looking at your internal organs won't tell anyone what sort of person you are. Emergence is how society becomes so rich, why fabricated products like smartphones are worth more than the raw resources that go into them, and probably how life itself came to be. Emergence is powerful. All right, enough of theory. Let's take a look at some real examples to help paint a better picture in your head. We'll start by looking at the behavior of systems with one stock in two balancing loops. An example here that we'll use is a house with a thermostat. This is an example that we've used here previously. Here, the stock is the heat in the house represented by internal temperature. And the two balancing loops are the systems that kick in when the temperature gets too hot or cold. Let's say that you turn the system on on a hot summer day and the temperature in the house starts well above where it should be. The thermostat kicks the AC on and the temperature reduces, gradually approaching the optimal level. A similar behavior exists when you turn it on during a cold winter day. The heater kicks in and the temperature is raised gradually to approach the optimal level. When looking at a graph of the stock level over time, you'll notice that it typically takes the form of an exponential decay function. With only these two feedback loops affecting the stock, the system tends toward a dynamic equilibrium. The next example we'll take a look at is a system with one stock, one reinforcing loop, and one balancing loop. Here, a culture of bacteria in a petri dish would be a good model for us to examine. At the beginning, we have a certain growth rate for the bacteria, and the more bacteria we have, the more it can grow. That is, when the reinforcing loop is dominant. Once the population of bacteria crosses a certain threshold, however, resources become scarce and the bacteria will start starving and suffocating each other. This is when the balancing loop begins to dominate. With these systems, they'll typically have both exponential growth and decay, otherwise known as S-curves, all depending on which loops are dominant. The last example of a system with one stock is a system where there are delays. No specific number of loops here, so we'll take a look at one with two balancing loops. Here we'll look at a shoe store as an example. The stock here will be the store's shoe inventory, outflows will be customer buying shoes, and inflows will be production from a factory. Say the manager wants to keep three days worth of shoes in inventory, and the inventory starts out constant with balanced inflows and outflows. All of a sudden, consumers start consistently buying more shoes. The store manager can increase the amount of shoes they bring in from the factory to act as a balancing loop for when the shoe inventory gets too low. Normally, this would pretty much solve the issue. However, let's say that there is a delay of several days for the factory to ramp up. During those several days, the inventory of shoes keeps dropping and the manager becomes increasingly concerned, ordering more and more shoes. Finally, the extra shoes start coming in and the stock heads back up. But now the manager has ordered too much, so they start cutting back on the order of shoes. Inevitably, as we'll see, the manager will likely misjudge and cut back far too much, forcing them to order more again. Just by throwing in a delay, the whole system is thrown into a cyclical order. Depending on the length of the delay, the graph of the stock over time may appear as a sinusoidal wave that either converges or diverges. Looking back at the three different examples of single stock systems, we can actually see some characteristics that emerge from these simplistic models that we've shown here that apply to more complex systems. Can you guess what they are? Pause the video if you want to think about it. So systems will almost always have a number of reinforcing and feedback loops, each at different strengths. In addition, each of these loops will have some sort of delay, either for information going into the loops or delay of reactions from the loops. Whenever the balancing forces dominate, the stock will tend towards some dynamic equilibrium. The graph of the stock will have some sort of horizontal asymptote, and the graph will exhibit some exponential decay characteristics. 
When reinforcing forces dominate, the stock will rapidly depart from where it started in an exponential manner. And when you throw in some delay into the loops, when the balancing loops are dominant, you'll see some oscillations. Depending on the delay length and the reactions from the loop, the oscillations may dampen out over time or it might grow out of control. What we've really learned here isn't some behaviors specific to these different single stock systems, but universal behaviors that can help us predict how systems will react over time. This is precisely what systems thinking allows us to do. Now let's examine what happens when we have two stocks at play. Here we'll take a look at an oil economy where there are two stocks, the stock of oil left to be extracted and the stock of capital resources to extract it. One stock is non-renewable, the oil, and one stock is renewable, the capital. I've also graphed out the oil extraction rate, which is the only flow here for the oil stock. At the start, we'll see that with the capital, the more we have, the more money we can make to buy more capital. Clearly, reinforcing loops dominate here. Another balancing loop is slowly increasing in power, however. As the stock of oil drops, it becomes less and less profitable to extract that oil as more effort is needed for each machine to extract it. It would only make sense to extract the most readily available resources first, after all. But at a certain point, the company operating the capital will actually stop buying capital and start selling them because it costs too much to maintain them all given the amount they can extract. Operations slowly grind to a halt, and for the most part, the rest of the oil stays in the ground as it is no longer profitable to extract it. Sound oddly prophetic? Well, you haven't witnessed the collapse of the global oil economy just yet. Here we see the dynamics of depletion occurring any time that a non-renewable desirable resource is being extracted. To get a better understanding of depletion dynamics with my likely incomplete modeling, let's tweak a few parameters and see what happens. What happens when we double the amount of oil there is available? All else equal, how would you expect the dynamics to change? All right, keep those thoughts in mind as we take a look at what happens. Looking at the oil stock, it appears that even with double the oil available, the remaining oil drops to basically zero only about 10 years later. Double the oil does not mean double the amount of time you have to extract it. Looking at the capital stock, it appears that it peaks about five years later than it would originally. But notice how the decay is steeper. And looking at the oil flow, you can really see what's happening here. The peak extraction rate is quite a lot higher, but it only peaks roughly five years later and it drops off much faster. What happens if we start off with 10 times as much capital resources? Say you've already drained out a reserve and now you have lots of cash to throw at a new one you found. Well, as you can probably guess, all else equal, all this does is shift the peaks earlier with much steeper drops after the steeper peaks. Now, how about if we doubled the efficiency of our capital, doubled the reinvestment rate, or doubled the oil prices, halved the maintenance cost? Using my incredibly rough models, you see that they amount to roughly the same results. Each boosts the peak oil extraction up tremendously and moves that peak forward many years. The only real differences here would be in the capital stock. Less capital was accumulated from the efficiency since less capital was needed to increase extraction rate. Increased reinvestment or oil prices led to enormous capital accumulation before needing to retire most of it. With lower maintenance, the capital actually lasts longer since it doesn't need as much to keep running. Now, take all these graphs with a grain of salt. My models are by no means accurate and don't even ask me about the absolute numbers in there. The point here, if you've picked up what systems thinking is about, is not the absolutes, but the trends and relationships that we see. All of the scenarios I've presented here represent what companies might want or aim for. More capital, more resources, higher efficiency, more reinvestment rates, higher prices, lower maintenance. What do they result in? A higher peak in capital and extraction rate and generally shorter operational timeframes. If you're aiming for sustainability, that's not good. What are you gonna do with all of that capital you've accumulated once you're done with the deposit? The infrastructure you've built, the people you've hired, the economy you've built, and not to mention all sorts of other impacts, what's going to happen now? That goes into the resource curse, or the Dutch disease, and that is a topic for another episode. Another typical system where there are multiple stocks also involves harvesting resources, but this time they're renewable. 
Examples of this could really be of anything that is farmable, like fish or crops. Here we have the same capital stock as before, but this time the resource stock has its own reinforcing feedback loop to regenerate it. In reality, it'll also have a balancing loop, but for resource extraction, it becomes pretty negligible since extraction tends to be the dominant before the population hits growth limits anyways. Once again, the capital stock keeps increasing from reinvestment of profit and the resource stock keeps plummeting. At a certain point, the capital starts to cut back because it is no longer profitable to keep harvesting it. For example, less fish available means more expensive boats and nets needed to capture them. This can eventually drop back enough so that the population can start growing again, at which point more capital will be invested to harvest that extra population. Eventually, the system may come to a point where extraction matches that of population growth and the system comes to a stable point. However, if we're not careful, the system could be thrown into oscillation, just like the shoe store owner's inventory. And if the population level dips below a critical threshold, the population may not be able to regenerate and the entire system may be thrown into depletion dynamics. The renewable resource will become non-renewable. At this point, you may want to pause the video and just think about all the systems that are starting to make sense in your head. Are you beginning to see where your world may be heading? This is exactly what systems thinking offers you. The ability to notice macroscopic relationships and behaviors and how they may evolve over time. Taking the analytical path of thinking, you typically won't come to the same conclusions. Too expensive to get the oil out of the ground? Just improve oil extraction technologies. Not enough fish in the area? Just import some more fish and do absolutely nothing about how people fish. You can really see the power of systems thinking here compared to the traditional linear and reductionist way of thinking. Just swapping out components may not be enough, and sometimes it might make the situation worse. Systems thinking deals with systems. Analytics deals with sets. Now, despite me harping on analytics all this time, it's not as if we need to abandon it. These ways of thinking are not mutually exclusive. They complement each other. Without analytical thinking, we won't have the components to make connections with. Analytical thinking and a reductionist paradigm has allowed humanity to bring out the wonders of physics, chemistry, and modern science to benefit humankind. With that being said, however, we are starting to see the limits of this thought regime. Let's take a little deviation and talk about formal languages. Formal languages are ideas and models that are independent of external references and depend solely on its internal logic. Essentially, they are logical operating systems, a way of thinking. Examples include systems theory and set theory, or modern mathematics. For formal languages, if the logic is consistent, then it works. If it's not, then it doesn't. This logical operating system is crucial to how we understand our world. At present, the dominant formal language is that of set theory or modern mathematics. We see it everywhere in contemporary sciences. Recently, however, people have begun to realize that this isn't the best approach to every aspect of science, and it especially has struggled with the recent growth in human societies and its complexity. We need to balance both of these formal languages in order to reframe our worlds. In the end, formal languages are really just ways for conscious actors like you and me to understand the unknown environment that we live in. Analytics can point to the what, the bare stuff that we can play with. Our how and why, however, can only come from systems thinking. Don't be a sheep though. Don't take everything as is. We have what is called a bounded rationality, which essentially describes how real actors don't have access to perfect information. You and I will never know how everything works and what everything is. We have to make do with what we have. Every mental model that we make is based on our bounded rationality, the imperfect evidence that we've collected. And as we grow, we amass more and more evidence, making our models more and more accurate but it's precisely this bounded rationality that makes it critical that we expose our mental model. That way they get tested and they get refined. As the statistician George E. P. Box once said, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Systems thinking is a model, a powerful model 
that challenges many of contemporary society. However, it is just as wrong as every model that we've seen. But we as actors get to choose which models are useful. This is why systems thinking is so crucial. As a society, we have swung the balance far to the side of analytics and reductionism. We've tried these approaches, but the modern problems that we face are not being solved by this way of thinking. In fact, it may have become worse or even emerged because of it. The next generation of actors that guide humanity must take this into account as we navigate forward. So hopefully I've sparked something in you guys today, whether it be curiosity, enlightenment, or a desire to continue this conversation, whether regardless you guys agreed or disagreed with what I had to say. So as long as I got you guys thinking, my work here is complete. Thank you all so much for watching this episode. I appreciate the support that you all have given to me. Let me know what you think about systems thinking in the comment section down below. If you agree, disagree, found inconsistencies, or have improvements for me, I'm all open to hear them. That's it for this video. Take care, and I'll see you in the next one.